binary stars. These are stars that pull each other around. Instead of a planet going around the star, you have two stars that pull each other around, spinning around. And he said as follows, here's Earth, and here's these binary stars. Now, this star is going like, is going like this, coming towards Earth this way, and this star is going away from it. He said as follows, if it wasn't perceived as constant, then this light should hit Earth faster than this light, which is going away from it. Okay? If that was the case, then viewing the binary star going around, it would come out discombobulated, as my daughter always would say. Okay, just, you know, mishma. Okay? Um, namely, this one should be seen first, and that should be second, and this should be second. It would be all confused. And he says, it's not confused. We can see binary stars going around each other. Okay? And so this one, this larger, and this smaller is wrong. They both come at the same speed. So this was one reason why it was believed that light is always perceived constant. Okay, but this is a beautiful intuitive um, idea. There are other reasons too. Oh, sorry. Okay. And there are theoretical reasons of why light should be constant, namely the, the equations that describe it, the Maxwell's equations, they don't they, 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 they don't care if the if the perceiver is moving towards the light or against the light. So but that's not that's not important. The important thing is light is always perceived as constant. Okay. So you have a space shuttle standing still. You have another space shuttle moving along. You have um, Kirk, uh, Captain Spock, uh, Captain Kirk from firing a light phaser. Okay, and he's firing a light gun, and the gun is is going at the speed of light. But here's the thing: both perceive the light ray the light ray at the same speed, 186 miles per second. Something's wrong. Okay. In other words, he's not moving, he's moving, but they both see the light and going at the exact same speed. Let's go to the real world for a second. Let's not deal with Captain Spock doesn't really exist. Let's go to the real world and, and talk about that. Here's some classical stuff. You have a green car, you have a red car, and you have a green car. And the green car is standing still, and he perceives the red car is going 50 miles an hour. This green car is moving at 30 miles an hour. What should he perceive this as going? 20, 20 miles. Perfect. Okay, so let's let's go through. Stationary green, that's him, go, uh, sees red going at 50 miles an hour. Moving green, that's him, should perceive red going at 20 miles an hour. What if moving green also sees red going at 50 miles an hour? Okay, now, what if he sees him also going at 50 miles an hour? Well, there's something wrong. Okay, there's something screwy in what he's doing. Okay, the moving green is making a mistake. Because he's going 50 miles an hour and he's going 30 miles an hour and he should see him at 20. He's not measuring the speed correctly. He's doing something wrong that's measuring speed incorrectly. Speed is measured by distance divided by time. That's the way, 50 miles per hour. 50 miles is a distance divided by how long it takes by hour. Okay, so moving green is either measuring distance wrong He's doing something wrong. He's either measuring distance wrong or measuring time wrong. Okay. So, again, if this was a mistake, if he did say he sees him at 50 miles an hour, he's making a mistake. And we're just analyzing where is this mistake coming from. Let's go back to the, to the thing. If he says he sees the light at the same rate as he sees the light, he's measuring wrong. One of two things. Either his measuring rod is smaller, shrunk, or his time is got messed up. And that's exactly what special relativity says. Special relativity says that if you're moving very fast, close to the speed of light, okay, either your measuring rods are gonna shrink or your clock is gonna shrink. But it's not only a measuring rod, I can use my finger as a measuring rod, I can use anything as a measuring rod, okay? I can use my finger to measure how far, everything's gonna shrink. So that's a very strange thing. What it says is as follows, and if you notice, this is big, this is small. Everything on this ship, if it moves close to the speed of light, is going to shrink. And every single time mechanism that I have on this clock, including my heart rate, is going to go slower. And so that's a shocking thing. One second, let's, let's, let's see it on um, here. Okay, space contraction. When objects move close to the speed of light, they shrink in the direction that they're going. 
Um, time dilation. When objects move close to the speed of light, any process seems to go slow. And by the way, this time dilation, they actually do experiments. They take clocks, nuclear clocks, and they, put them, they, they pair them up, okay? And they put one on an airplane. Take the airplane, fly it around the Earth a few times. Come back, and they see that the clock is at different periods. Okay, so they, they really, they, they, this is done experiments. This is a little bit harder to find experiments because when you slow down, first of all, how can you measure if something shrinks if all your measuring instruments also shrink? So it's a little bit harder. And also, when you slow down, it unshrinks. So that's a little bit harder. But the time dilation, they do have experiments. Okay, objects going fast most must go, and by fast I mean close to the speed of light, must go through lunge contractions and time dilations. Now that's a shocking thing. It's a, it's a, a, there's no absolute space. There's no saying, okay, no, this is exactly, this, this, this thing is exactly three inches long. It's not exactly three inches long, because I can move it very fast and I'm, I'm shrinking it. When you move this, it shrinks. Very smallly, but it does. Okay. There's no absolute time. It depends on how you measure it. Okay, so whether or not the speed of light, whether or not the, something goes fast or slow, depends on how fast you measure it. And it's a shocking thing. Okay. Uh, it's all relevant. Now, immediately, whenever you hear this stuff, you say, that's nonsense. I'm not moving right now. And this is three inches, and that's three inches, and it's going to stay three inches, and it, it's not true. Okay? And, you know, this clock is exactly the right clock. So there's an urge to simply wave away all the talk of relativity and insist on absolute space and time. Merely declare that measurements done while being stationary in Earth, that train is moving, but I am now stationary. Uh, are the absolute measurements and every other measurement is relevant. Simply say that, okay? I'm not moving, see me moving, I'm not moving. I can't move, I can't have to be here. Okay. There's a problem with that, okay? The Earth is spinning around its axis at about 1,000 miles an hour. I don't feel it, but we're moving now at 1,000 miles an hour, going around, you know, day, night, et cetera, et cetera. The Earth is rotating around the sun about 67,000 miles per hour. Our solar system is moving around our galaxy at about half a million miles an hour. So we're all moving now. Okay, there's no such thing as, you know, exact. And why, you know, the speed we're moving depends on the size of the Earth. It's not really interesting. Poke your finger into the air. Wait a second. Now poke your finger in the same place. Realize that the two places where you poke your finger are hundreds, if not thousands, of miles apart. Okay? Okay, I... I it moves. Okay. A stationary observer on Earth is far from stationary. We're not stationary. We're constantly moving and we're moving very fast. Okay, so there's no such thing as absolute space. There's no such thing as absolute space. Okay, summing up. Despite it being counterintuitive, the length of an object and the time for the process to happen is dependent on the motion of the observer. There are no absolute observers, no absolute measurements, and there's no absolute space and time. All is well. Now what? There is a, this is a, in the globe of the math problem, so you might have seen this fine. But it's nice. Okay, so this is Galois. This is Galois when he was 15, but don't be upset that I don't have a more updated picture because he didn't really live that much longer. Okay, so on the night before he died in a duel, he wrote a very important letter to his friend describing his mathematical work. Okay, and again, he died, it's 21 years, but he was actually 20 when he died. Okay. Now, here's the letter, and we have the letter. And there was Herman Weil, who was one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, and he writes this about this letter. Now, hold off the humor, hold off the laugh. This letter, if judged by the novelty and profundity of its ideas it contains, is perhaps the most substantial piece of writing in the whole literature of man. Okay, now, I promise you, there's nothing I ever wrote that he would say that about. He didn't say it as a joke. He meant it. Now he might have been wrong, he might have been a little bit bombastic, but he really he really meant it and he said it. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you what this is about and why it's so important. Okay, so some history. First let's go back to some history. So this is called the linear equation, and it was known in ancient times, and you can solve it x is equal to minus p over a. Okay? Given a and b, you can solve that. Okay? Here's a quadratic equation, ax squared bx c. Given a, b, and c, you can figure out what x is. Um, and also, this was also known in ancient times. Question, what about cubics? Okay. 
what about cubics? Well, there's a formula for cubics. It was found by this guy, Cardano, um, in the 1500s, and they found it. Now, we don't teach this formula because they would beat us well. up. <laughs> okay, so as a teacher, we don't teach this because we like our life. And we're kind of, you know, their nerves and a, so, but there is a formula, and it's, by the way, for a linear equation, there's only one answer. For a quadratic equation, it's x plus one, plus or minus, so uh, for a cubic, there's three possible answers, okay? And, and the, the, it exists. Okay, question. What about for a quartic, with a four, okay? And so this was done also in the 1500s, the late 1500s, and they, they solved this equation. But the equation is too hard to it's to, 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 to draw it down. Okay. What about a quintic? X to the fifth. Okay. So these two guys, notice he died also early. This is uh, Abel. Abel died in 27. He died in poverty. Um, by the way, one of these guys kill, was killed by the other one's sister-in-law. He thought he was rich. It's a whole... <laughs> it's a great book called Men of Mathematics. It's got all the sex and the wild stuff. It's very interesting. Um, but uh, these guys also had miserable lives. Um, this one had a miserable life. Okay, and they proved that in general, there's no equation. There's no way of solving this equation. There's no way of solving this equation um, using squares, square roots, cube roots, fifth roots, tenth roots. There's no way of solving a point. Comes along, comes along Galois, and he says, what about x to the fifth minus one? This does have the solution. Bring the minus one to the other side, you have x is equal to one. Okay. So what he realized was, sometimes there are, is a solution, sometimes there's not. Okay. Question, when is there and when is there not? When is it solvable, when is there not, and it's not solvable. Okay. Now Galois, this is what, what he was discussing. He was working on this for a couple of years before him, not too much because he was a little kid. Um, but he was able to tell by looking at the numbers of the polynomial when there was a solution and when there was not. Okay? And he did this by talking about the symmetries of the equation and the symmetries of the solution. Okay? And he's described by a topological, uh, by a mathematical object called group. And that letter was the first time that he used the, the word group was found, was, was found. So that letter. Groups are used throughout modern mathematics and modern physics. This is what Herman Weil meant. By, by it being important. The word groups, you cannot do math and you cannot do physics without knowing what a group is and what symmetries are all about and things like that. And this is what he's telling you. So Galois theory tells us the limitations of our ability to do things um, because there are certain symmetries that the equations satisfy. Okay? And so these are limitations. Again, for, for x to the 1, x squared, x to the 3rd, x to the 4th, we have ways to do it. For x to the fifth and higher, we can do it. We cannot solve these, these problems. Okay, now just to bring you back to the real world instead of talking about equations. So you all know this game, and you have to take you know something, it's mixed up, and you gotta get it back into here. Okay? Now you gotta transfer from one to the other. Okay? So go let's go this way. Okay, well, if you can go one way, you can definitely go the other way. Okay. However, if you just had everything in order except this is 15 and this is 14, there's no way in the world that you're going to be able to do this. Okay? And the reason is, is because there's a certain symmetries of the moves that you make. And this would violate the symmetries. To get from here to there would violate the symmetries. In fact, you have 15, if you take the pieces out, like I do, Okay, you take the pieces out, you have 15 factorial possible ways of doing it. Okay? If you put them back in, 15 factorial divided by 2 will be able to get into this nice position. The other 15 factorial divided by 2 will only be able to get into these two, and you won't be able to go from one to the other. Okay? So it, it's, it's about symmetries and it's about this group theory. There's a certain action that you're following the other group um, that this is all about. More important is the, Gal is the Rubik's Cube, okay? If you ever want to, I have four brothers, three brothers, and if you ever want to torture them, what you do is you take the Rubik's Cube and take the end of it and turn it a little bit and then click it. Not a legal move, okay? And then mix it up 
Okay, just you take this and turn it this way. Not a legal move, and then you 